Hi, this is Presh Talker. In this video, I'm going to illustrate three methods for proving E is an irrational number. The first proof is by contradiction. We'll assume that E is a rational number. Then we'll look at the infinite series for its reciprocal 1 over E. This will lead to a contradiction that an integer minus an integer will equal a fraction, and so we can conclude E must be irrational. Let's assume that E is rational, that it can be represented as A over B for two integers. Recall the power series is the sum of x to the n divided by n factorial. 1 over E can be found by substituting negative 1, and that'll be the sum, the alternating sum of the reciprocals of factorials. Now if E is rational, that means 1 over E is also rational and will equal b over a. And this is where we're going to show there's a contradiction. The key thing is grouping the infinite series for 1 over e into the terms going up to a and then all the terms after a. The thing is no matter what term you have for a, we're going to have a problem that all those extra terms are going to be this fraction. And that's going to lead us to this contradiction. So let's imagine subtracting 1 over e minus all of the terms up to a. What we end up with is b minus a minus all of the terms up to a, and that'll be equal to all of the terms after a, going from a plus 1 to infinity. Let's multiply each term 1 by 1 by a factorial, and then we add this negative 1 to the a plus 1 factor, this will just be so that our alternating series starts positive. You'll see why in a minute. But basically, think about multiplying each term by a factorial. When we multiply b over a by a factorial, we end up with b times a minus 1 factorial, and then we have the negative 1 to the a, a plus 1. The key thing about this term is that every single term in it is an integer. The negative 1 term is an integer, b is an integer, and a minus 1 factorial is also an integer. So this entire term is an integer. We then multiply a factorial by all of the alternating terms going up to a. What's important here is that the denominator is always less than a factorial. And that means every denominator in this alternating series is a factor of a factorial. So each of these terms in this alternating series is an integer, and therefore the alternating sum of integers is also an integer. So these terms are all integers. So we now have an integer minus an integer being equal to whatever remains. So now let's multiply whatever remains by a factorial. When we do that, we end up with the first term as 1 over a plus 1, and then the second term is minus 1 over a plus 1 times a plus 2. We then end up with a bunch of other terms, it's an alternating series, but every denominator will be larger. So the next term will be 1 over a plus 1 times a plus 2 times a plus 3, and so on. What's important about this series is that we can have an upper bound on it. Clearly this infinite series will converge to something that's smaller than the first term because we're subtracting things after it. So the upper bound is 1 over a plus 1 and we can also find a lower bound as the sum of these first two terms. When we do that we'll find out that this has to be between 0 and 1 because a has to be greater than 1. We know that 1 over e cannot equal to something divided by 1. And this is where we get the contradiction. We have an integer minus an integer equaling something between 0 and 1. This is not possible. So there's no way we can represent 1 over e or even e as a rational number because we're going to end up with this contradiction. Therefore, E must be irrational. 
A second proof by Jonathan Sandow is a geometric interpretation. We're going to construct E from line segments. We'll then show that E will always be between fractions of n factorial. We'll show that every rational number would equal a fraction of some n factorial. And since E cannot equal a fraction with the denominator n factorial, this means E is irrational. We'll construct E from line segments. We'll go ahead with the infinite series. The first two terms are one plus one. So we have a line segment which starts at two. We then want to add one over two factorial to it. We can do this by considering a line segment of length one, a line segment going from two to three, and then we need to add one half. So we'll divide this into two pieces. And in order to add one over two factorial, we'll just keep the second piece. So this second piece, this is getting us closer to E. Now we want to add one over three factorial. So three factorial is found from dividing one over half into third. So we need to divide this one half into three pieces. We go one, two, three. And in order to add one over three factorial, we again keep the second piece. So we know that E is somewhere in the second line segment. To add one over four factorial, we divide further into four pieces. One, two, three, four. And once again, we keep the second piece. So E will be somewhere in between the two endpoints of this fourth interval. We can continue this process iteratively by dividing the next piece into next line segment into n pieces and then keeping only the second piece. As we get all of these intervals, we can then say that E will be the intersection of all of these intervals. We're getting closer and closer and the intersection of everything will be equal to E. Now, how does this help us? If you look at the endpoints for each line segment, that's going to be the key insight. The first interval goes from two to three. The second interval goes from five over two factorial to six over two factorial. The third interval goes from 16 over three factorial to 17 over three factorial. You can write an explicit form for each interval. And it turns out that for n greater than one, each subsequent interval is always between the endpoints of the previous one and it always has a very specific form. It's always going to be between two numbers, a and a plus one, with the denominator n factorial. So if you look at the second interval, it's between five and six for two factorial. If you look at the third interval, it's between 16 and 17. And that's the key insight. No matter what denominator n factorial we have, every single interval will be just a difference of a and a plus one and we know that e is somewhere in between it so e is never going to be a fraction for any denominator n factorial so why is this important this is going to lead us to our contradiction we know that e is not a fraction with any denominator n factorial however any number that is rational will always equal some fraction of n factorial. How is this? Well, consider we have a rational number p over q. If we multiply the numerator and denominator by q minus one factorial, we have the rational fraction p times q minus one factorial over q factorial. So every rational number can be expressed as a fraction with some denominator q factorial or n factorial. So since E can never be represented as a fraction with any denominator n factorial, we can conclude E is irrational. There's a third proof I want to mention that comes from Euler. I'm just going to sketch the proof out. The steps are to show that E has a continued fraction representation that's infinite. 
The second observation is that rational numbers always have a finite continued fraction representation, and that'll imply that E has to be irrational. So E has the following continued fraction representation. It's equal to two plus one over the quantity one plus one over the quantity two plus one over the quantity one plus one over the quantity one plus one over the quantity four plus so on. We can write this continued fraction representation in a simpler way. It's always going, we always have one over something. So if we just look at the other parts, the other numbers, two, one, two, one, one, and four. These are the only pieces we really, numbers we really need to know in this continued fraction representation because everything else is redundant. It turns out that E has the continued fraction representation that starts with two, one, two, then it goes 114, 116, 118, 1110, and so on. Every third number in this increases by 2. This was proved by Euler. I provided a link of this proof in the video description. There are some interesting functions that you have to go through and show that there's a convergence. But you can prove that E has this continued fraction representation and it's infinite because every third number keeps increasing by two. On the other hand, rational numbers always have a finite continued fraction representation. This is due to the Euclidean division algorithm. So I'll give you an example. Let's say we wanted to convert the number eight over three into a continued fraction. We know that eight over three is at least two. We end up with two and two thirds. So in order to get a continued fraction representation, we need this two thirds to be one over something. So how do we get one over something? Well, let's consider the reciprocal three over two. If we divide three by two, we get one plus one half. So we can also write two thirds as one over three halves, which is then one over one plus one half. And now we have a continued fraction representation of 8 thirds, which is 2, 1, and 2. And this terminates in a finite number of steps. And for any rational number, this will always terminate in a finite number of steps due to the Euclidean division algorithm. So since, finite, since rational numbers always have a finite continued fraction, and E has an infinite continued fraction, we can conclude, therefore, E is an irrational number. I hope you liked this video. Please subscribe to my channel. I make videos on math and game theory. You can catch me on my blog, Mind Your Decisions, which you can follow on Facebook, Google Plus, and Patreon. You can also catch me on social media at Presh Talwalker. And please check out my books. I've written several books about math and game theory. There's a link in the video description. Thanks for watching.